Surprise! There's more than seven continents on our planet. Argoland, a hidden continent, may help us understand how our planet will look in the future. To find out how it hid from us and what secrets it holds, well, you'll just have to keep watching. Ready for a mystery? Scientists have been looking for a piece of land that's been missing for over 100 million years. Not exactly newsworthy, since people search for information about our planet's history all the time. You'd think it was probably this minuscule island somewhere in the middle of an ocean. Well, you'd be wrong, because this continent used to be as big as the entire U.S. territory. For a long time, geologists have been wondering whether a massive chunk of contemporary Australia vanished into thin air. Some believed it was simply hiding somewhere on the ocean floor. But thanks to some Dutch specialists and seven years of investigating, we now know there are bits and pieces of this lost land mixed underneath the lush jungles of Southeast Asia. The continents we see in our geography manuals these days are like scattered pieces of a puzzle. There's even a nice experiment you can conduct to see for yourself. Find a world map online and print it out. Cut out all of the continents and play around with them for a while. You'll see they all fit together. Probably the most striking thing you'll see is how South America perfectly fits near Africa. If you close up the oceans that were formed in the last 200 million years, the continents look like they form a giant letter C. And that C is what scientists call the supercontinent Pangaea. It was swimming in an ocean called Panthalossus, and the inner portion of that letter C had a smaller stretch of water called the Tethys Ocean. It is in this small ocean where things get interesting. Back in the Jurassic period, this vanished continent, which scientists started calling Argoland, vanished and left a hole in Australia, now known as the argo Abyssal Plain. Geologists initially believed this was all due to a process called subduction. It's when one piece of the Earth's crust dives under another and recycles it into the planet's mantle. Usually, specialists track this continental vanishing through off-scraping. That's how they figured out, for instance, that India bumped into Asia and gave us the majestic Himalayan mountains. But for Argoland, things were a bit more complicated. Bits and pieces were popping up in places like Myanmar and Indonesia. But they behave like these time-traveling relics, looking way older than when Argoland supposedly separated from Australia. It immediately raised the question. If one continent can behave so weirdly, how many others are out there doing the same? Thankfully, scientists have now put together the entire timeline of Argoland and figured out its mystery. It didn't sink or get swallowed up. It simply transformed into an Argopelago, breaking into smaller pieces called microcontinents and floating away from Australia. These mini continents then took a little journey before settling down in Southeast Asian jungles. This discovery fits right into the whole Pangaea puzzle. It helps us better understand how continents break up and make up, all in one discovery, revealing secrets of biodiversity and climate back from in the day. If you'd like to find out more secrets about history, civilization, or random day-to-day -day objects, be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel. Like, for instance, the mystery behind this invisible species line in Indonesia. It's called the Wallace Line, named after the British explorer Alfred Russell Wallace. Over 150 years ago, Wallace was on a journey around the Malay Archipelago, visiting thousands of islands. What he found was that animals on one side of this invisible line were considerably different from ones on the other side. This invisible line is like a wall between marsupials and tigers, for instance, or honey eaters and trogons. But now we know that around 35 million years ago, Australia broke up with Antarctica and collided with Asia. And this continental love triangle triggered significant changes. It didn't just change the way the land looked, it also messed with the species of animals on each side of the Wallace Lawn. In more recent times, a bunch of specialists published a study saying this collision and climate chaos made Asian species comfy living in the Malay Archipelago. Meanwhile, the Aussie animals weren't as happy with the new environment. It was too hot and wet for some, and others just couldn't handle the tropical island lifestyle. 
The discovery of this continental shift towards Asia might also explain a recent finding of a human species that didn't seem to make any sense either. You see, in this hidden cave in the Philippines, archaeologists stumbled upon a new human ancestor. It seems that about 50,000 years ago, on the island of Luzon, there was this ancient human-like species. The lead researcher believed this finding was crucial for understanding human evolution in Asia, and it named this new species after the island, Homo luzonensis. Now, here's where it gets a bit confusing. The bones found by archaeologists had one small problem. They had a weird mix of traits that hadn't been seen together in any other hominid species. Smaller teeth, similar to ours, yet hands and feet that were more like our ancient humanoid ancestors. It was those throwback limbs in particular that connected this human species with the long-lost southern territory. That's because they have this primitive look, like these hard-to-pronounce guys, for instance. Only these two species are separated by 2-3 to three million years of time and evolution. Many have wondered, is Homo luzonensis really a new species? Not everyone is convinced. But it may also explain why living creatures are also affected by the constant shifting of the land underneath us. Now, just because they haven't changed much during our lifetime, it doesn't mean our continents will look like this forever. They evolve from this large megacontinent, and they'll most likely end up in a similar position in the future. On that note, a geologist from a European university tried to predict the future of Earth's supercontinents. As a starting point, he used an earthquake that occurred in Portugal back in 1755, when tectonic plates behaved a bit differently than they should have. After years of research, he came up with a theory in 2016. He believed that the stitches between these tectonic plates might be coming apart, setting the stage for a bigger rupture. It's like when glass cracks between two holes in a car windshield. If this happens, a subduction zone could stretch from the Mediterranean all the way up past Ireland, bringing volcanoes, earthquakes, and new mountains to these areas. If all goes according to this plan, the Atlantic Ocean will disappear, and so will the Pacific, turning into one large stretch of water. Instead of the seven continents we know today, we'll get a new supercontinent, which he called Arica, because it would have Australia and the Americas at its heart. Now, it's not the only possible scenario, though. Novo Pangaea might be another, and it's easy to foresee. The Atlantic stays open and the Pacific closes. Then there's Amasia. For this one, you'd have to imagine the Arctic Ocean closing and the Atlantic and Pacific staying open. Everything shifts to the north around the North Pole, except Antarctica. One final scenario would be called Pangaea Ultima. Slow down the spreading in the Atlantic, and a new subduction plate pops up on the America's east coast. Well, either way, if all the continents collide in the future once more, some say it won't be fun to experience. It's believed that in around 250 million years, we'll feel like we're being trapped in a sweltering, soggy plastic bag. Weirdly, that bag will be the best place to live on Earth, the coastal areas. As for the inland spots, they'll be sizzling, like a desert on fire. Many of the species of animals we know today might not make it. As for us humans, we'll need to be creative if we want to withstand the heat. We should be thankful, though. These digital models are still great because we can use them to test all sorts of interesting ideas. For example, how these supercontinents would mess with tides. Taking future space travels into consideration, these models can help us understand the climates of exoplanets, too. Those are located outside our solar system. The world's largest fence spans over 3,100 miles from Queensland to South Australia. If stretched out, it could easily connect London to New York. And if you'd walk next to it, you'd need six months to complete the journey. It wasn't built to safeguard the Australian border. Why would it, since Aussies are just surrounded by water? It wasn't meant to protect some important building either. Its purpose is to keep some animal species away from each other. It was back in the late 1800s when Australians started building parts of this fence. They wanted to create a barrier separating the lively, bustling part of the country where cities like Melbourne and Sydney's thrive from the harsh, dry outback. They used wooden posts, 
dug deep into the ground, linked up with wire mesh standing about six feet tall. Some parts of the fence even have a second electrically charged layer. To make sure this fence did its job, they added some red and white lights to help guard things even at night. A team of over 20 people work full time to keep things in check here. And every year, local authorities chip in around $750,000 to keep the construction in shape. Why all this trouble? The main reason was dingoes. These gingery, wolf-like creatures are Australia's largest carnivore mammals, and they're also apex predators. They were causing a lot of trouble to local farmers, especially in southern Queensland, where they often go after sheep. For the most part, the fence has been doing its job okay, but it's not foolproof. Some dingoes still manage to sneak through. Other times, wild camels end up crashing into it. That's because Australia has quite a massive camel population roaming around. But this man-made solution did more than locals expected. They thought there would just be fewer dingoes within the fence. But fewer dingoes mean more kangaroos. And more kangaroos mean more competition with the sheep for food. It's not just the bigger species feeling the squeeze. The smaller animals and the greenery also went through changes. With all this competition in a smaller space, locals noticed less diversity in the plant life and small animals. The soil became less nutritious over time, affecting plant growth. Plus, the fence acts as a roadblock for animal migration and seed dispersal. Even the sand dunes are feeling the effects with less grass cover to hold things together. When scientists looked at kangaroos on both sides of the fence, they noticed that the young pups inside were lighter and tinier on average. The outsiders had bigger feet and heads for their age, and it wasn't because they were eating a different diet. The kangaroos that were stuck sharing the land with dingoes had to bulk up faster to survive. On the flip side, those inside the fence took it slower because they weren't under the same type of pressure. These had to compete with a lot of other creatures for food, so a bigger size wasn't a priority anymore. Researchers are still not sure if this difference is a quick fix or a long-term gene adaptation. What about domesticating dingoes? Wouldn't that help? Many think dingoes were once pets in Australia, but it's not known for sure. These days, they're pretty wild, just like wolves, hyenas, or coyotes. Most of them don't need packs to survive and are solitary hunters with sharp instincts built in. So taming them isn't gonna be easy. Still, taking down the construction is not an option for now. Australians are so strict when it comes to making sure dingoes are kept away that they even put laws in place for people who mess up with the fence. Leaving a crossing gate open can put people behind bars for up to three months. Damaging the fence can cost people six months worth of their freedom. It wasn't the first time Australians thought a fence could help with animal issues. Before they needed it for dingoes, they experienced a serious bunny invasion. Cute as they are, rabbits were damaging the land used for farming, so locals thought of a three-part fence. The first one stretched all the way from Ravensthorpe in the south to Pardue Station on the Pilbara coast. It was over 1,100 miles long, making it the longest unbroken fence globally at the time. All these bunny problems could have been traced back to a man named Thomas Austin. Back in 1859, when he first came to the land down under, he thought it would be a good idea hmm. to release a few rabbits into the wild, thinking it would add a bit of charm to the place. But since rabbits aren't native to Australia, they didn't have any natural predators at the time. They're also pretty adaptive creatures, needing just some grass for feeding. They reproduce at astonishing speeds too. A mama rabbit can have four litters a year with as many as five bunnies each. Pretty soon, their numbers boomed. By the late 1880s, the bunnies had caused so much damage that local authorities came up with a proposal. They'd offer the equivalent of almost $2 million today to anyone who could come up with a solution to this long-eared problem. Nobody claimed the prize, but a commission did gather a bit over a decade later and came up with the fence idea. Maintaining those fences was complicated. They had inspectors keeping an eye with each one responsible for a stretch about 500 miles long. 
There were also these boundary riders patrolling smaller sections, using bikes at first, then switching to camels or using camels to haul buggies. They even tried using cars at one point, but they couldn't handle the rough terrain and constantly had punctured tires. In terms of its effectiveness, well, by 1902, rabbits were already hanging out on the wrong side of the fence. That's why, four years later, they put up another one. It worked for a while, so much so that the local authorities didn't bother helping out farmers pass that second fence with rabbit netting loans. Those caught between the two fences, however, still had a rough time dealing with rabbit trouble. Soon enough, rabbits spread even over fence number two, and it was clear the solution didn't work. In some areas, even while the fences were being built, those sneaky bunnies found their way past them. To this day, the rabbit population still sometimes puts the Australian officials through rough times. The dingo fence may be the longest one, but it's not the weirdest. The aquarium fence in Turkey might take that prize. This 164-foot aquarium fence was built to make sure the expensive villa's ocean view would be visible from every one of its levels. These days, it gathers a lot of tourists from all over the world, eager to see the variety of fish it contains, and even the octopuses. Putting up a see-through structure wasn't hard. The real challenge was connecting the aqua fence to the Aegean Sea through a buried pipeline stretching across 13,000 feet of land. This ensures water constantly flows, keeping the aquarium clean and the fish happy. To make sure no one damages the delicate fence or steals any of the fish or two, the owner also invested in security. He installed a network of 17 cameras equipped with facial recognition. Visitors are free to look and take pictures, but step too close and you're likely to trigger alarms. Another one of those weird fences is New Zealand's bra fence, if you ever find yourself through central Otago, you might stumble upon a fence adorned with bras of all kinds of shapes, sizes, and patterns. Its story takes us back to 1999, when people in the area found four bras mysteriously hanging on the fence near Cardrona Valley Road. Some were a bit surprised, but then others started adding their bras to the decor. Some more bras appeared and it became a must-see spot for tourists. Its popularity was so high that at times it caused traffic problems in the area. Scientists claim that Icelandia was a region between Greenland and Scandinavia that was more than 230,000 square miles but is now underwater. The Earth was once a large pizza pie with all the continents connected to each other millions of years ago, otherwise known as Pangaea. The North Atlantic region we know today was dry land from about 335 million to 175 million years ago. For many years, scientists and geologists assumed that the North Atlantic Ocean was birthed as Pangaea began to split apart roughly 200 million years ago. With volcanoes in the region where Iceland is, the country came to be just 60 million years ago as it broke off and sailed away from all the other lands. And since the Earth was like a large pizza pie, it divided like one. Many of the land split up into many large and small pieces, creating the continents we know today. But this new theory suggests that the result of Pangaea's splitting left out some land that stretched for around 200 miles. And just about 10 million years ago, that piece of land submerged in the waters on the eastern and western side leaving the tip of the land, which is now Iceland. When plate tectonics move, they grind on each other, which gave shape to our current landscape, all thanks to the mantle. This new radical theory goes against everything written in history books and what scientists have been studying. They began shaking heads, drawing lots of skepticism and criticism. But by analyzing the ocean floor under Iceland and the Earth's crust, we can assume that this idea isn't far-fetched. The crust beneath Iceland happens to be a lot thicker than the typical ones. Oceanic crust is made up of unique melted rocks compared to the land crusts where we walk and live on, and is a lot more denser. The thinnest layer on Earth is the crust, where life takes place. It's essential for water, growing food, 
gathering natural resources and minerals, and breathing in oxygen. It sinks below to the bottom, but right above the Earth's mantle. It also refreshes itself, since it constantly gets recycled into the mantle and back up. This is why the rocks in the oceanic crust are around 25 miles thick, compared to just 5 miles anywhere else. This is also reasonable given that it's in a hotspot for volcanoes. Magnetic surveys of the ocean floor show layers of molten crust in stripe patterns. Also given the fact that the Earth's magnetic field changed its polarity over millions of years, it played a role in shaping the foundation of our landscape. But there isn't any hmm. concrete evidence to prove this new theory just yet. One of the first steps is to start digging the ocean floor near Iceland. Zircon is a very sturdy mineral that can last for billions of years despite erosion in the Earth's crust. By taking samples and studying them, researchers can estimate the geological age of the continents. This will make sure the crust is oceanic, which is thicker, or continental, which is the regular crust we walk on. This isn't an overnight project and would come with a hefty cost. Another way is to do seismic surveys that can measure echoes conducted on research ships. Drilling holes miles deep in the crust can also help with the research. But this would cost more than studying the zircon minerals. Some fossilized plants unique to both Scandinavia and Greenland might prove that Icelandia was once on the surface and possibly scattered with trees. It wasn't a cold land as it is today, so it may have had forests. But scientists still haven't found fossil evidence of animals common in both lands to suggest anything. But maybe time will tell. The theory goes deeper, which suggests that there was a greater Icelandia. With Iceland, Ireland, Britain, Scandinavia, and Greenland all in one microcontinent, it could be a destination of winter enthusiasts and great for skiing. It could be possible to connect Canada to Greater Icelandia by train over the ocean, which would open up the economy even more. Iceland is around 40,000 square miles, which is already quite big. And if the Greater Icelandia was present today, then Europe would be a completely different continent. Many theories are circulating about other possible hidden microcontinents around the world. Scientists aren't certain of the possibility of Icelandia's existence, but if all the studies conducted were done correctly, then the theory could change everything we know about Iceland and the North Atlantic Ocean. And this could pave the way for other sunken microcontinents around the world. Another theory out there is that New Zealand was the tip of a lost subcontinent, even bigger than Icelandia, called Zealandia. Studies show that it separated from the supercontinent Gondwana between 79 to 83 million years ago. Scientists claim that it's the thinnest and youngest continent discovered underwater. Creighton is a core rock that acts as the main foundation for most continents. It's at least a billion years old, but the continental crust that makes up Zealandia is just half of that, which makes it quite young. That means some Creighton is missing even though it holds some leftovers of older rocks and parts of the mantle. They're estimated to be as old as 2.7 billion years old. Scientists did some studies on the zircon crystals from New Zealand and found out that they're as old as 1.3 billion years old. The rest of the continents are more than 3 billion years old. Scientists studied the composition of the rocks in the bottom of the ocean around New Zealand. They're made up of silica and granite, which are found in continental crusts. The ocean floors mainly have magnesium and iron-rich rocks. They're also thicker and higher than regular ocean crusts around it. They conducted some studies and collected magnetic and topographic data to see the link between the Tasman and Coral Seas in the Cato Trough region. This is the narrow strip between Zealandia and Australia. Satellite data tracked tiny faults in the Earth's gravity to map out the crust of the ocean floor surrounding the area. They saw the mass that makes up Zealandia quite visible and almost the size of Australia. Even though the signs are there, this doesn't prove anything. It's possible that there are a bunch of microcontinents which all split apart when Australia broke free of Gondwana. Back then, 
the supercontinent was made up of South America, Antarctica, Australia, Zealandia, Arabia, and the Indian subcontinent. New Zealand is already not the biggest country out there, but if the theories are correct, then Zealandia will be six times its original size. Mauritius is a young island that's only a few million years old. Just 1,200 miles off the coast of Africa, it's believed that the tiny island came to life around 9 million years ago. The underwater volcanoes in the region spewed out so much lava that it formed the land today. But scientists found zircon rocks that are more than 3 billion years old. It may also be part of a continent submerged underwater called Mauritia, which is just a quarter of the size of Madagascar. The zircons they found were embedded in solid rocks and not just in the sand, which may rule out that they just washed up on shore from another continent. Some scientists are still not convinced. They suggest that discovering rocks that stand out from the other typical ones brought by an eruption could skew the scientific community to this theory. But just like how Icelandia could be part of Greater Icelandia, Mauritia was once called Rodinia, which consisted of India and Madagascar. Theories suggest that Mauritia was covered in water when India broke away from Madagascar, something like 85 million years ago. So Venus and Earth are so different that a foolish question like, what's longer, a day or a year, that makes absolutely no sense on Earth, totally makes sense on Venus. A day on Venus is indeed longer than a year. If we put it into Earth's perspective, a day on Venus would equal 243 Earth days, while a year would only last 225 days. So it's like your birthday is every day. Venus is often nicknamed Earth's evil twin. Their differences are so stark, you think they're from different galaxies altogether. Just to give you an idea of how far apart they are, if the day-to-year ratio wasn't enough, the Earth rises in the west on Venus but sets in the east. These days, one of the very few similarities between these two is their size. But try to imagine a time when Venus and Earth were like peas in a pod besties since the beginning of the solar system. Venus used to be the life of the party. NASA scientists think Venus might have even hosted a liquid water ocean and surface temperatures that could have welcomed life for up to 2 billion years. But modern-day Venus is a different story. We're talking extreme temperatures and a thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. So what led to this cosmic makeover? Size, location, and attitude. I mean that the distance from the Sun and internal heat played a huge role in shaping Venus and Earth's destinies. By the way, there used to be three siblings that could have hosted life – Venus, Earth, and Mars. Now imagine three cupcakes in an oven. Once they were fully baked, they were taken out of the oven. One of them was put in front of an open window in the middle of winter. Another was carefully placed on a table and covered with a nice clean kitchen towel. And the last one was accidentally forgotten and left in the oven. Oops. Mars, Earth, and Venus are like those cupcakes. Mars got too cold and not welcoming. Earth is still nice and warm and well-protected from all the unpleasant things, just like the towel protects that lucky cupcake. And Venus got scorching hot and impossible to consume. In terms of development, Earth took the slow and steady route, maintaining its oceans, stable atmosphere, and biodiversity. Venus, on the other hand, cranked up the temperature, evaporated its oceans, and went all in with greenhouse gases. As a result, we have a planet where you'll melt faster than a snowman in July. Mars, on the contrary, will turn you into an ice popsicle within seconds. But chances are, it might have been pretty hospitable at some point. Some scientists believe that Mars used to be covered with flowing rivers and lakes and had no water shortages. Even today, Mars still has an ocean called Oceanus Borealis, or rather, the remains of what once used to be an ocean. It lost nearly all its water over time. Now, the sources of water on Mars include polar ice caps and minerals and rocks. According to estimates, only 1% of all that water evaporated, while 99% is still locked in the red planet. Ice polar caps are pretty simple to understand, as we have the same thing on Earth. But rocks containing water? Simple. There are at least four types of hydrous minerals on Mars. 
there are hydrous clays made of silicon oxygen. And the cool thing about them is that they can even contain magnesium and iron, which are sulfur-based hydrous sulfates. Now, don't you? I know you thought of the smell of rotten eggs. But it's typical of hydrogen sulfur and not just sulfur. These minerals have water incorporated right into their chemical formulas. There's also hydrous silica, which has water locked in its formula, too. Scientists have experimented with growing plants using Martian-like conditions and found success with alfalfa. Harvesting alfalfa also helped improve the growth of other crops, like turnips and lettuce. While water may be available on the red planet, the air on Mars is mostly carbon dioxide. On the bright side, and we are, the Mars Oxygen In Situ Resource Utilization Experiment we are, the Mars Oxy can produce oxygen on Mars, which could be crucial for future missions. As for energy sources on Mars, solar, wind, and geothermal energy are a few promising options. Solar power is less effective on Mars due to weaker sunlight and dust storms. But wind power and geothermal energy could serve as reliable alternatives. With these sources in place, humans could potentially sustain life on Mars. But let's get back to comparing our sibling planets. While both Mars and Earth have moons, and Mars even has two of them, Venus has zero, just like Mercury. Due to its proximity to the Sun and the star's gravitational pull, Mercury lacks the ability to retain its own moon. The likelihood of any moon orbiting Mercury either colliding with the planet or being drawn into the orbit of the Sun is high. That's all clear and understandable. But the absence of moons around Venus remains an unsolved puzzle for scientists. Despite Venus's scorching hot temperatures, scientists think that even today, it might not be as hostile to life as we once thought. A recent MIT study found 19 amino acids surviving in a Venus-like solution for the whole month. Yep, some like it hot. Also, Rocket Lab and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology are teaming up to send an uncrewed spacecraft, Venus Life Finder, on a mission to Venus. This spacecraft will search for signs of life in the Venusian atmosphere using a special instrument called an autofluorescing nephelometer. And no, I didn't make that up. Originally set to launch in 2023, the mission is now pushed back to December 2024 with arrival at Venus in May 2025. The goal of the mission is to discover organic compounds in Venus's atmosphere, which could point to the possibility of habitable conditions in the cloud layer. The spacecraft is designed with a Photon Explorer cruise stage and a compact atmospheric probe equipped with that nephelometer thingy. The small probe will descend through the Venusian atmosphere, collecting data on cloud particles and organic compounds. In 2020, scientists made a big announcement about finding phosphine on Venus, a compound that could be linked to life. While they're still working on confirming this, using information from telescopes or even past missions, there might be evidence hidden in old NASA data received from Venus that could shed more light on the discovery. The potential presence of phosphine on Venus has stirred excitement and caution among scientists. To make sure, they need more data from telescopes or new space missions. If they find this gas, it might mean there is some form of life producing it in the planet's clouds. This discovery would be a huge step toward understanding Venus better. Some experts think that sending probes to Venus to directly detect phosphine would be the most effective way to confirm its presence. An 80s NASA mission may have already detected phosphine, but scientists back then didn't realize it. Now this data is being re-evaluated to uncover any overlooked evidence of the presence of the gas. This could also suggest that the compound has been in Venus's atmosphere for decades, raising questions about its source. But not everyone is convinced of this interpretation, which evokes a debate among scientists about the true nature of the detected gases. Old data from other missions may also hold clues about phosphate on Venus. While new spacecraft are going to explore the planet, it's possible that the key to unlocking this mystery lies in decades-old mission records. In total, there have been 46 space missions to Venus, including some flybys where gravity lent a helping hand. 
The last time we successfully landed a spacecraft on Venus was way back in June 1985 as part of the Vega 2 mission. So, let's see what Venus Life Finder will discover. <laughs>